Great. Thank you. Well, I'm actually very excited to say that I'm coming up on my 10 year anniversary at Salesforce. Um, I did. Yes. Yeah, started 10 years ago. It was really random how I ended up here. I actually used to live in Guatemala um, where actually Pierre is from. And so when I met, when I came to Salesforce, he was one of the first people I met here, but I used to live in Guatemala and I actually ran and owned a call center there. It was actually a contact center because we focused on back office. And when I moved to back to the United States, I kind of recognized that it was just going to be really difficult to continue to be working with a company in Guatemala while I'm here. It's just not, it's not the same if I was in the office or at the center. So I started to talk to, to some friends and they brought up Salesforce because back then Service Cloud was just launching. So they figured it would be a good fit. And that is exactly how, you know, talk to some people was very um, bold and aggressive and out of my comfort so, uh, zone to get the right people to talk to, to get an interview. And I was brought in under the service cloud practice. So originally I was supposed to help out with some offerings and some go-to-market things. And then in doing that, I recognized that a lot of the stuff that I was doing was really enabling people on specific offers or products and things like that. And as I kind of continued to progress in my journey here, I recognized that I really liked the actual enablement work. So I applied for a specific job in the global enablement organization. Um, and I have been there forever now. So I've been there now, I think it's been now eight years that I've been specifically in global enablement, um, which is very um, interesting because a lot of people at Salesforce shift around in their career. So I have been in the same organization and it's been great. So still here coming up on 10 years and we'll continue on enablement until they kick me out. <laughs> oh yeah, of course. I'll be here for the, for the same. Till they, yeah. until they tell me, nah, you're done. Uh, you gotta go. Yes. Yeah. Pierre, how about you? What was your journey like to Salesforce? Uh, I can't, so uh, yeah, I've been here for 13 years, right? So yeah. it's been a, it's quite a journey, but I actually came in through a, an acquisition. So I, I used to work for a smaller consulting company uh, which did specifically implementation delivery for, for Salesforce. And I had joined that uh, company through some networking that I did through an old manager I had previously uh, who said, this is a great opportunity. It's a small consulting company. And I think your skill sets would work here fine. So I went through the process and little did I know that when I accepted the offer, like within two months, we were sold <laughs> to Salesforce. So um, upon Salesforce, there was obviously a realignment uh, and I ended up in services uh, just like a, uh, like a business analyst and then moved into like a project manager uh, role. But then, you know, I've, I've been here for 13 years. Like I said, when we were first were acquired, we were like a growing company. So Salesforce was approximately about 9,000 employees. Currently mm -hmm. we're 80, almost 80,000 employees. So through that process in my journey the last 13 years, I've actually um, moved around a little bit to different roles. And, uh, and here I am, I came back uh, to services. So I'm a director in the services organization, continuing to love the work I do, especially since it's customer facing. Oh, yeah, of course. Customer facing is, uh, it's a different beast, but it's also, it's very exciting in a lot of, in a yes. lot of ways. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yo, 110%. Well, it makes the days more interesting though, right? Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah. All right, Elsa, you told us that you are celebrating your 10th year very soon. Pierre, you've told us you're with uh, the company for 13. I want to know what's kept you here. Elsa, what is it? Is it like Taco Tuesday in the lunchroom? Is your, your <laughs> sweet parking spot out, you know, under that shady tree? I mean, I will say um, I am based where both Pierre and I are based in Chicago and the office is honestly unbelievable. It is a really great space. So if anyone is ever here, send us a LinkedIn message. We'll bring you up to the Ohana floor to get some free coffee, which is great with the very stuff there. But that is not what has kept me here. I think for me, it's just really been um, the culture of innovation, right? The ability to like, I know one, you know, it's kind of back and forth. Like sometimes we say the one thing at Salesforce, it's always constant is change, but that change actually fuels you. So I feel like every year I get to kind of reinvent myself and start something new. So like I can go back for the past nine years and say, okay, this was the year that I did X. This is the year that I did Y. This is the year that I did Z. So that kind of constant innovation and being empowered to be able to drive like that work on my own has been just something that's kept me here. Um, I do think that the work we do is really impactful. And I also just like to have the opportunity to be creative um, and challenge myself and grow. And then lastly, I have an amazing team. Um, the team that I work with and my peers are amazing and it's just a fun environment overall. So still yeah. here. I think that's all you can ask for in a lot of places. Pierre, how about you? What's the thing that keeps you at- uh, I would echo you know, a lot of what Elsa mentioned. I think for me, it's uh, 
not only the team and, and my management team, because, uh, you know, it's very important to have a really uh, supportive management team or throughout your career, but also at the same time, uh, the opportunities that exist within Salesforce. Like I said, uh, it's been growing uh, so much, especially with the innovation and everything and our products and everything that we do. So, you know, there's always room for for moving to different roles that are interest you and in, in making sure that you continue to grow yourself because, I mean, there's a, you either grow for yourself, meaning that you you feel like you're you're doing something valuable, right, within your organization. So, and that's always going to be there. It's just you you have to perform at the same time, right? So it's not like you you, you just can easily move. It's it's performance and just uh, you know doing the right thing. Also, what keeps me around here is like outside of my my coworkers, I'm the global president for our Latino Force BRG group, which is a business resource group. So that in itself is a different job. That's it's like I have my day job and I have that job, right? And, oh, and at yeah. the global level, it's a lot. Uh, but, you know, interacting with every hub globally, like I was just in Mexico, I was in London, I was in, you know, Paris, and just go to meet with them and understand what are some of the things that they're facing and the challenges that they're facing that they actually, um, you know, hope that Latino Forces, the BRG group, can support them. So not only am I adding value to my day job, but also adding value to our community within Salesforce. So that's uh, also what keeps me around. Oh yeah, such a great feeling, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so we've talked about your <laughs> incredible and very incredibly different roles during your tender, tenure with Salesforce. Mm -hmm. um, and when you all described your journeys, um, there was definitely a kind of a what now moment that required you to kind of step back, be more strategic about the right step um, that you know, kind of would lead you to that career that you're passionate about. Um, and I think that's a, you know, what a lot of us are looking for, right? We want a job that we can enjoy, something that aligns with both what our energies are, what our strengths are. Um, but it can be kind of hard to know what direction to go. So are there any steps that you think someone should take to gain more clarity on what they enjoy in a role or a career path that will get them past that what now moment? Pierre, do you want to hit us up first? Yeah. Um, I guess for me, there's a couple of things that I look at, right? The first thing is like, I need to consider what my... Like what's my lifestyle what's my value right because there has to be some type of role that's going to be able to balance my life outside of work um you know look at what are my priorities and as an example like when i joined here i always wanted to work internationally and that was also a passion of mine because i love to travel as well <laughs> outside of work so looking at opportunities i was able to find something uh where i position myself to be uh uh an expat in argentina so i flew out to argentina and i worked there for a couple of years um so, you know, that's the lifestyle and values. Like, does it align with what I want to do? And does it align with, with what I like to do outside of work? The second thing I would say is like always be able to and open to explore different roles and different industries. Like there's always opportunity to, you know, ask somebody, can I shadow you? Can I just understand what you do on a daily basis? Is that something that, um, you know, would interest me? Volunteer for special projects, you know, understand if see if that's something that you also want to do, right? Because, in an organization like Salesforce, we're, we're so big, there are so many products that you might want to do something different than, you know, work face on like a uh, service cloud versus sales cloud or even do, you know, enablement for that matter, right? Um, and then also focus on your past experiences. Like what have you done in the past that, you know, you think you can bring to the table and make sure that also provides impact and value to the organization and to the group that you're working with. So I think those are the things that like, for me, uh, I kind of focus on to bring clarity. Do I really, really want to continue doing this role? Or do you think I have, a, you know, the skill set and, and, you know, expertise to do something else? And I think that's how I approach it. Yeah, I think that's a really good way to do it. And, it, you know, I love that the questions you're asking yourself are not, it's not that they're not difficult questions, they are, but they're mm -hmm. not impossible questions to answer. And I feel like a lot of the reasons people don't necessarily have that answer at their fingertips is because they haven't really given themselves the, the time, you know what I mean? You haven't, they haven't like blocked off yep. the time and be like, all right, I should probably think about what I want to do long-term or I should think about, you know, what I want to do at this moment. Um, Elsa, was the, was the feeling kind of the same for you? Was there, you know, are there any steps that you took or that you think people should take to get more clarity on what they enjoy so that they, they are able to carry themselves through that, oh my gosh, what now? I agree with everything and echo on what um, Pierre said as well, too. I think also additionally, like for just to highlight, um, taking on those, like when he mentioned, like the stretch projects, the side projects, that gives you an opportunity to see how other people work, what other teams are doing. So that's a really great opportunity to see like, hey, you know, I worked on this project. 
there was this team, you know, that team was doing some really great stuff. And then you make the connection and you start talking to people. And then I think also like having that self-reflection, like, I love what you just said about like, do we actually really sit down and say like, what am I doing? What do I like about it? Does it keep me energized? I think that's like one of the things for me too, is like some days I'll be like, oh, I'm not that energized. And then I'll start to think like, what else can I do? And that's when I, I will start to look at like stretch projects or side projects or talk to my manager and have an open conversation and and also getting that feedback, right, from not just your manager, but maybe you have peers or mentors and kind of be curious about what others are doing inside the organization. Like we work in such a big organization, there's so many opportunities. So it's just always about, you know, being curious and having, you know, people to talk to about what their roles are and how to kind of just continue to see, well, what's next? Yeah, I'm, I'm loving that you both keep coming back to this idea of curiosity, right? Like, follow it, mm -hmm. see what are you interested in? Because if you are starting, if you're leading from a place of curiosity, it's going to be a lot easier to maintain that motivation or that interest in the subject. If you're starting from an honest like moment of like, oh, mm -hmm. huh, well, I want to know more about that. Um, all right. Now, as I'm listening to both of your stories, y'all are both very ambitious. You like to take risks. Um, do you think that that comes from a specific place? And do you think that could you share a, a, a moment where a, taking a risk led to a career breakthrough for you? Pierre, do you want to start us? Well, yes. Uh, you know, risk for me is something that I always kind of like, oh my gosh, should I do this? Should I not? What, what's going to happen if I don't? Um, I would say at least here at Salesforce, the biggest risk I took was to actually take this engagement in, in LATAM in Argentina, right? Because it's kind of like you're lifting your entire life you don't even know, you're going there by yourself. You don't know what's gonna happen. You're leaving your family and friends behind. It's like, you're starting anew, right? Mm -hmm. um, but what I realized is that, you know, risk is something that you feel scared of, but you just have to do it because, you know, you, you're you well prepared for certain situations. I mean, your experience and your work and your life, you're so prepared, it's just just do it. Take that leap and, and take that risk and do it. And what I, what I learned out of it is like coming um, back from Argentina uh, after a couple of years, um, you know, it was fulfilling because not only did I, you know, do, like I said, I come back to lifestyle and values. For me, that was that's something like, oh, I'm going to Argentina. This is great. I can travel everywhere else, like Brazil or anything around that. But professionally, it enabled me to uh, expand um, my experience within the organization. I learned how things work differently because, you know, uh, here in the U.S., we our business ethic and and process is totally different when you do it internationally, right? So I learned that aspect of it. So I kind of grew, grew from that. I understood a little bit more. But then outside of that, the people that I met uh, outside of the organization and inside, um, I realized that I can definitely um, leverage them as well for support. And especially within Salesforce organization, creating those relationships is, was, was key for me. And I still leverage that to this day, even though I've been back for three three years, those relationships that I've cultivated down there are continuing to grow. And I know that I can continue to expand that even though I'm here in the US. Yeah, very cool. I'm glad that I'm gl glad you were able to have that experience. It sounds really invaluable. Mm -hmm. um, Elsa, how about you? Has there been a moment where you took a risk that that definitely led you to a significant career breakthrough? Yeah, I mean, I think actually how I got into Salesforce was my biggest risk too. Not a risk, but first of all, I just do want to reiterate, like I think sometimes risk people look at it as kind of like, oh, it's a negative, but it really isn't. Like just going back to what Pierre said, like if you take these risks, again, going back to this theme on curiosity is you really just kind of open yourself up to different opportunities. But um, I think I took a risk with just coming to Salesforce. Like for me, I, as I mentioned, I did have my own call center. I wasn't happy at the moment. It was in Guatemala. I was already living in the States. I was traveling a lot, which to me was just exhausting. I had two little kids back then. Met with a friend and she's like, oh, you should come to this world tour in, um, in Chicago for Salesforce. Like this company's great. There's this guy that's going to be there. He runs service cloud practice. You would be a perfect fit. And I was really ambitious and bold and took a risk. And I literally, they told me who he was and I walked up to him and I was like, my resume is in your email right now. I think that I have a lot that I can offer you, which is a really bold and very like arrogant or I don't know, like confident. No, that's a great line. My, my, my was, resume is in your email. I mean, obviously like, you're just like, wait, did you just really just walk up to me out of nowhere and say this? So I think that was a risk that I took and it actually got me into Salesforce because after that I got my interview and then I was able to, you know, obviously my work spoke with itself, my experience and everything like that. And that was a risk I took. 
I mean, I did just decide, like I had a company, I had something that was working, but I wasn't truly happy. So I decided to take the risk and say, okay, maybe I'll just go work to corporate America. And yes, has it been different than, I mean, obviously like running your own business and doing 75,000 different things, but like still, we're still in a startup mentality here, even though we're so big, but that was one of the biggest risks I took. And I just think that, um, you know, sometimes those really help out and it just opens different opportunities. Like Pierre said, going to a different country just gives you so much great depth into what career opportunities there are. Yeah. I like this. And I mean, honestly, just listening to y'all talk, like we all take risks every day, right? Like they, they might be calculated and the risk itself might be very, very, very small, but we still do it. And so if you, if you're thinking about it in terms of, all right, well, you're going to be taking a risk no matter what you do, whether you're sticking where you are or you're exploring something new. Um, you know, I think that, that push to like, just try it, see if it works, just just do the thing. Um, it can be really helpful for people. Um, all right, now you have both mentioned that meeting people and pitching yourself for an opportunity obviously has led you to the next step in your career. Um, now, <laughs> Elsa, we heard vaguely your elevator pitch a little bit of uh, my, my resumes in your inbox, um, but has or have there been any other elevator pitches or any advice you'd have for somebody to craft their elevator pitch about why they're worth investing? Um, I can start out. So I think there's two different types of elevator pitch. There's that pitch that is just like, I have it in my back pocket when someone says like, what do you do? What do you work? And that one, I would definitely say like, you have to highlight like your uniqueness and just kind of like the impact that you've been able to drive. And it has to be really concise because you have like a tension span of like, five seconds for anyone that you're talking to. And then the, the the other type of elevator pitch is like for me, when I, when you're looking for a job or you're trying to get a customer or something, it's really doing the research on that person. Like what is top of mind for them? I actually mm -hmm. ran a program here at Salesforce. Um, it was one of the first things that I developed in the enablement organization, which was customer centric conversations. And it really honed in on like doing the research on either your possible customer or the person who's interviewing you or the company that you're doing, but like really understanding their business well enough. So then you can go backwards and craft your pitch based on that. So like if Meg, I know that I'm going to speak to you today and I do a little bit of research and I know that, you know, you love birds or I don't even know what I'm saying here. Like you like to take hikes, sure. I take a picture of you and I can say, have an icebreaker because I know you like to take hikes. Like, oh, I, I noticed you like taking hikes and that can get you kind of like the, um, opening liner to be able to be able to say and then just go into just a very concise specific like overview of like what are your strengths what makes you unique and what value you're really bringing into um that person if it's a career or conversation or whatever it might be good yeah i think those are really good those are good things to include pierre how about you what do you think people should think about when they're talking when they're gonna gonna craft that elevator pitch i i completely agree with Elsa. actually that's uh, similar to my thoughts i for me, the biggest thing is, and I think kind of also mentioned a little bit about it, is like know your target audience. Like when you when you talk to somebody as an elevator pitch, you want to make sure that you're aligned to their priorities, that the values that they're looking for you have, and you can basically tell them and define based off of your experience and skills that you can deliver that, what they're looking for. So the biggest thing for me is know who your target audience is. Like Elsa said, if I go to a conference, you know, in Vegas or something, who am I going to, who are my targeted people that I want to talk to, right? Who am I going to pitch pitch to so i think that's the biggest thing and then the other thing is like <clears throat> always make it fun start with a hook like you know something fun that will will uh get their attention and then you can start talking and defining more about your skills and, and how you solve problems and i think those are the two biggest things for me is like know your target audience and always start with a hook that's going to get them interested because otherwise they're just going to be like any other person who walks up to them and, and tries to get their attention and and sometimes uh you need to stand out Right. Yeah. No, I think that's great advice. Absolutely wonderful. Um, okay. Networking is one of those topics that can be very loaded for different people, depending on how you feel about it or, you know, how, what your experience has been. Um, and it can be a challenge, but it's a muscle that obviously we all kind of need to learn how to flex. So that way we mm -hmm. can utilize it to our own benefit. Um, what advice do you have for people who might not have not much practice with networking and the self-promotion required for career growth? You know, it can be really weird to kind of brag about yourself. Um, Pierre, what do you say to these people? You know, what what should they um, what should they do to help help practice that networking and that self promotion? Mm -hmm. 
Um, I would, you know, a lot of people in the office say that I'm the, the, the king of networking here at Salesforce. I mean, I, everybody knows me, everybody knows, oh, here comes Pierre, right? So um, the way that I approach uh, networking, like if you're starting out, I would always, there's, there's a couple of things, like you need to start small, like, you know, don't like, oh my God, who am I going to, you know, go network with? But when you do those, you, you want to be able to start creating relationships based on people that you share similar interests with and and you see that um that you have similar backgrounds but also when you go reach out to that person make sure that you go there for creating real relationships not like mm -hmm. just transactional i don't want you to be because i want to add you to my rolodex it's kind of like we want we have these interests that we share let's be let's create that relationship and be real about it because that that only is going to make sure that that relationship keep, continues to grow and then people will continue to refer you, right? Because they're like, oh, I know Pierre and, and, and this and that. And I think that's how I've done it. But also I would say when you're starting out, you know, you already have a network, just leverage your relationships, whether it's your family, your friends, people at work, there's always somebody who's gonna, you know, be out there to support you in any way they can. Because like, I have my brother who, I'm a twin by the way. So, uh, you know, there's two of me. There's one roaming around somewhere right now in Chicago, but. <laughs> Um, and he's also in the same industry as me, also that he owns his own business. So he's a CEO. And um, through him, I've developed really great relationship with people in the industry. So you never know. You don't need to go out and, and you know, people, you know, even your family, your friends are going to know people. And then you can continue to leverage that um, connection. So, you know, that's one avenue. And the third one is always be curious. Like when you go out to events, even if you're at a dinner or something, just be if you meet somebody who's a friend of a friend, be curious and ask questions, right? Ask questions of, yes. you know, what they do and, and try to find that similarity because yeah. out of curiosity, that's where you develop a lot of good relationships, whether if it, whether if it works out or not, those are like, that's like an exercise you can do, right? Just start asking yeah. questions, make sure you're aligned. Um, but those are the biggest things. And I, and I think when you, when you are curious, you also show interest, right? So you show interest in them and that, that that's going to capture a little bit of, of like, okay, well, Pierre's curious about what I do or Pierre's curious about this. So let me build that relationship and network. And, and you never know. And I, I have networking relationships from 15 years back and they still are very fruitful because I'm like, hey, do you know somebody that can do this or I'm looking for this? And they're like, yes, and, and they can just do it. But those are the three things. Start small, be real about your relationships, leverage your family, friends, network, and just be curious. Those are the three things that I would say. That's good. I love those. Elsa, what do you say? If you, if you, if somebody does not really have a lot of practice with networking or that self-promotion angle, what do you tell them? I think it's going back again to this curious theme. And also it's, it's a two-way street, right? Like if you go to an event and you see someone, they're probably seeing, feeling as just as uncomfortable and thinking, oh my gosh, how am I going to go up to someone and just say hi? I mean, I know just the basic like, hi, my name's Elsa. What do you do? Or what brought you here? Or what are you looking forward to in this event? So I think it's just understanding that like, it's a two-way street, right? Like you might be thinking that I want to meet that person because it's important to me for X, Y, Z, but they might have already done the research and said, I want to meet you because this might be something that might be of interest for me. So I think it's kind of what like Pierre said to ensuring that just kind of like, you know, it's a two way, you can offer support, you can follow up, you can maintain the connections, but it is a little bit of work on stuff and just understanding that um, keeping curious um, and that someone might be feeling the same insecurities that you are when you go to a networking event. Um, and always like, you know, leverage all the relationships that you have. I find myself sometimes saying that I'm like an airport traffic controller because I'm like, oh, have you met with this person? Have you met with this? Like we can connect you. Um, but yeah, just keeping curious and open. Excellent advice. I love, love, love all of this. Um, okay, we've got about five minutes left. So we probably have time for one more question. Um, when we talk about career growth, we often discuss the value of mentorship, but you have both become champions for yourself and the people that you manage for sponsorship. Can you tell us the difference between sponsorship and mentorship and how you identify sponsors and cultivate those relationships in an authentic way to help you on your career journeys? Elsa, do you wanna start us? Sure. Um, I, think, I think the biggest difference is like, I see a sponsor as someone who is going to 
impact your career directly. So it's someone that's going to help to say, hey, like a mentor might be like, oh, this situation came up. This is how I'm going to address it. What do you think I should do? But a sponsorship is someone that's actually going to go out and say like, I will help you get this. Like I think of it also like right now in promotion cycles, when they come up, I say to my team, okay, let's look at some sponsors. Like who can say the great things that you've been done, like you've been able to do and that like the impacts that you've driven in the company. So it's really about the sponsors, that person that's actually going to go a little bit further. The mentor is going to help guide you and give you advice like, oh, in these situations, you might look at this, you might look at that. But a sponsorship is someone that's going to, a sponsor person is someone that's really going to be able to help you advance in your career, right? Um, really just kind of advocate for your career and the opportunities um, and help to actually like drive the next step. Like a mentor might be like, oh, have you thought about exploring this career or that career? But a sponsor might be like, there's this opportunity. I can talk to, so like talking about networking, I can connect you with someone. I can help, you know, put in a good word or something like that. I can see that. So sponsorship feels a little bit more, not necessarily nuts and bolts, but maybe like more, um, uh, like opportunity based as opposed to like yeah. a mentor kind of over helping you try to oversee most of your career. Would you, would yeah. you, that's, yeah. Yeah. That's how I see it. And someone that's going to be able to like talk to your impact that you're driving in your, in your job. Okay. Yeah. Pierre, how about you? Do you agree with this I kind of separation? I completely and... agree with us. That's, I, I would say that the sponsor is a champion. Somebody is going to speak for you when you're not in the room. Right. Um, and that's how I got my opportunity to, you know, go to Argentina because I had, you know, already, talked with one of uh, uh, my sponsors and said, if this ever comes up, I'm your man, I'm your man. I mean, I speak two, three languages. I love, you know, traveling. I've been to Argentina many times and, and like literally about a year and a half later, I get a call and saying, hey, you know, remember that you told me about this? Hey, there's this rule and I already put your name on it. So um, yeah, this person looked out for me and next thing you know, I'm, I'm on my way to Argentina, right? So. I think that's the the sponsorship level is that champion who knows your interest and your value and is going to be there and speak for you when you're not in the room. Because a lot of these discussions happen at, at different executive levels that you don't even aren't aware of these conversations even happening. Right. But they were going to position you for that. Um, and I think that's the biggest thing in mentorship. And I, I think, you know, also said it the best. I mean, it's somebody who guides uh, somebody in their career. I mentor people that I've allowed myself the time to really put some thought into how I can help them grow. And some of these people already been promoted, right? So it's just how can you help guide somebody? Uh, and, and mentorship is also, it's a two-way street, right? Because I learn from it as well. I mean, um, they, they, they educate me on, on things that I'm not aware of. So I think mentorship goes both ways. And I do, uh, sorry, I'm going to add no, go. that about the two way street. Um, I've actually had, you know, I've been mentor for some people here at the office. We have a partnership. I'm also involved with the um, BRG here for Latino Force. I'm actually the president of the Chicago um, location. And I work with Salesforce Women's Networks and they asked me to be a mentor. But when I was a mentor, it ended up being that it was like a two way street. So I would go to my mentee to ask her for advice on some you know, different parts of the organization I was unaware of. So I think keeping that top of mind that um, going back to the networking, everything is always a two-way street and there's value in the relationship from both aspects of what you're coming into it. Yes, yes, 110%. You can learn just as much from your mentors as they can learn from you. Mentors do not have to be somebody above you in t in tenure, seniority, on the on the ladder or the lattice, however you want to describe it. Um, I think that's really important to remember. Um, and especially, you know, kind of folds in with what Pierre said about, you know, being, being authentic, being real, following that curiosity to, to build and maintain a friendship, basically, is what we're talking about, right? It's making friends in business. That's pretty much it. Um, all right, we're almost at time, but Pierre and Elsa, thank you both so much. It has been really great to get to talk to you more about how things work at Salesforce and what your, your journeys have been like. Um, so thank you to you both for sharing your time with us, as well as your expertise and your experiences. It's, very, very valuable and we're really appreciative. So thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate the time.